The true message of Jesus as a title implies that there is a false message out there. And for us to determine what in fact is the true message, we must look at the evidences, the authentic and reliable evidences that can support any claim to be the true message of Jesus. We will be introducing our speaker, inshallah, who will be giving a talk entitled The True Message of Jesus, Peace Be Upon Him. And that is Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Just a bit of a background on uh, Brother Abu Amina. He was born in Jamaica in the West Indies and he grew up in Canada where he accepted Islam in the year 1972. He completed a BA from the College of Islamic Disciplines in the Usuluddin at the Islamic University of Medina in 1979 and an MA in Islamic Theology in 1985 at the University of Riyadh, the College of Education. In 1994, he completed a PhD in Islamic Theology in the Department of Islamic Studies at the University of Wales. From 94 to 2001, Dr. Bilal founded and directed the Islamic Information Center in Dubai, UAE, and the Foreign Literature Department of Dar al-Fatah Islamic Press in Sharjah, UAE. In the year 2001, Dr. Bilal established the Islamic Online University, the first accredited Islamic university on the Internet. He was a professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at the American University in Dubai and University of Ajman, UAE a lecturer and director of Da'wah and Education at the Qatar Guest Center in Doha, Qatar, and is currently the Dean of the Islamic Studies Academy in Doha. So I'll present, inshallah, Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips to give his talk entitled, The True Message of Jesus, Peace Be Upon Him. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The true message of Jesus as a title implies that there is a false message out there. And for us to determine what in fact is the true message we must look at the evidences the authentic and reliable evidences that can support any claim to be the true message of Jesus we need to examine what I may perceive as the false message and its evidence as well as the evidence which I will present to support the truth. And for any Christian who truly wants to know what in fact did Jesus convey? Who in fact was he? Then I invite each and every one of you to put aside emotion because emotions blind. One cannot see the realities when one is overcome by emotion. Emotion by its very nature is important. We are emotional beings. 
we love, we hate. But if emotions don't follow knowledge and they precede knowledge, then we end up loving and hating the wrong things. Often, not all times, but often enough, we end up loving and hating the wrong things. So I invite our Christian guests because this, of course, is of most importance to them to put aside emotions today and look at the facts. To get a clear understanding of the message which Jesus brought and who in fact was Jesus. There are two basic ways that we can produce evidence. They are from two basic sources. Either from the historical record, what historians have gathered, or from revealed scriptures. These are the main two sources. That is for those who believe in God. Of course, if the person doesn't believe in God, then revealed scriptures may not have any real significance to them. They will say it's only the historical record. When we go and look into the historical record for evidence, there is virtually nothing available from the time of Jesus. May God's peace be upon him. A biblical scholar by the name of R.T. France wrote, No first century inscription mentions him, and no object or building has survived which has a specific link to him. In fact, the historical record is so absent of information concerning Jesus that there are among Western historians those who claim he never existed, that he was a fable made up. So then where do we go? to find out about Jesus for those who believe in God the only place left is the scriptural evidence and the main two scriptures revealed scriptures of what is what are recognized as world religions the main two scriptures are the Bible and the Quran, which speak about Jesus. These are the main two scriptures that we can look into to find evidence as to what was the message of Jesus and who was the person. Jesus Christ. Now if we start with the Bible, what we find from the evidence gathered by biblical scholars, not by Muslim scholars, but by biblical scholars researching the Bible, they have come to the conclusion that much of it is of doubtful authenticity. We find a group of scholars in the UK, theologians, 
university professors in theology, Christians gathering a compilation of writings on Jesus into a text which was called The Myth of God Incarnate. It was edited by Professor John Hick. In it, in the preface, the compiler wrote, it is accepted that the books of the Bible were written by a variety of human beings in a variety of circumstances and cannot be accorded a verbal divine authority. He wrote this after saying in the 19th century, Western Christianity made two major new adjustments in response to important enlargements of human knowledge. The first was the acceptance of evolution because there was a struggle between evolutionists, biologists, and the Christian church. And basically, the Christian church lost in the struggle. So the vast majority of Christians accept evolution. That was one major change. The second major change was that from the analysis over more than 200 years, it was concluded by their leading authorities that the Bible was not the Word of God. This is what this means. Cannot be accorded a verbal divine authority means it wasn't the Word of God. There were human beings who wrote it. They said here, in a variety of circumstances, at a variety of different points in time, by a variety of different individuals, that is the reality. In Newsweek magazine, some years back, in an article entitled, O Lord, Who Wrote Thy Prayer? O Lord, Who Wrote Thy Prayer? A group of theologians in the U.S. They, after analyzing, these are theologians from all of the major sects of Protestantism and Catholicism. They gathered together and they formed a group which they called the Jesus Seminary. The Jesus Seminary. And they wrote a text which they refer to as the five gospels. In this text, they mention the well-known four and what they did was they color-coded the text into different colors. One color represented the text which they were certain or reasonably certain that Jesus actually said. Then the next level of color coding were texts which were possibly what Jesus said. Then what was highly unlikely that he said. And then that which was absolutely certain he didn't say. So they gave it different grades with different colors. The fifth gospel was the gospel of Thomas, which had been discovered in uh, 1945 in Egypt, in, the, in Nag Hammadi, written in Coptic, a translation, 
and which had confirmation from documents of the first and second century, bits and pieces which had existed in Greek. Prior to that, people didn't know what these documents were related to. And it was after the discovery of that Coptic translation that they realized that these were bits and pieces of the Gospel of Thomas. Anyway, the point is, this group, the Jesus Seminary, they concluded, after analyzing the Lord's Prayer, what is known in Christianity as the Lord's Prayer, it begins, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so on and so forth. Give us this day our daily bread, and etc. This is the standard prayer for Christians. Similar to Al-Fatiha for Muslims. Muslims recite the first chapter of the Quran in their daily prayers. So for Christians, the Lord's Prayer is the most central prayer shared by all Christians. And in the biblical context, in the Gospels, it is Jesus who is telling his companions this prayer that they should make. Anyway, the Jesus Seminary, after analyzing the Lord's Prayer, concluded that the only words of the Lord's Prayer which could be accurately attributed to Jesus, meaning it's highly likely that this is what Jesus said, the only words turned out to be one word which was Father. One word of the whole prayer which Christians have been saying for centuries, believing that Jesus actually taught this. Now the meaning of the Lord's Prayer is good. It has a good meaning. And actually from the Islamic perspective, from Islam, there really isn't anything contradictory Though the issue of God being the Father, human beings being His children, is something which one may raise objection to, unless it is used in a metaphorical context, and it's understood that that's how it was used anyway. So the meaning was fine, but the reality in terms of scriptural authenticity was that it couldn't be attributed to Jesus. And when you go through that text, the five Gospels, and look in the four Gospels as to what could be accurately attributed to Jesus according to what they said, it would be enough to fill one column of a newspaper. You know, the newspaper, the average page is divided up into a series of columns. It would only be enough to fill a single column, a little more than a single column. Meaning that the vast majority of what is found in the Gospels cannot be accurately attributed to Jesus. The Gospels themselves According to Dr. J.K. Elliott of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Leeds University in the UK, he stated in an article entitled, Checking the Bible's Roots, more than 5,000 manuscripts contain all or part of the New Testament in its original language. It has been estimated that no two agree in all particulars. It has been estimated that no two agree in all particulars. Meaning that you have 5,000 manuscripts and from that 5,000 
it is not possible to establish a single authoritative text. Not possible to establish a single authoritative text. As a result, and this is modern research, he wrote that in the latter part of the 80s. Modern research shows that the well-known Bibles that are in people's hands today, the King James Version being the most popular, this version, like all of the versions that came after it, relied only on a few manuscripts. They didn't use all of the manuscripts. They relied only on those which went along with church dogma. So, when, for example, it was decided that a revised version of the King James was to be made, the authors, scholars, Christian scholars who got together, they wrote in the introduction describing the King James Version saying, the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision of the English translation. Errors, mistakes, so many and so serious that it required a new translation. And in the process, what they did is they deleted texts and they added texts. And with each revision, they added more and deleted more. So the text has gone through a series of revisions. However, as stated earlier by Eliot, all of these revisions are based only on a few manuscripts. Not 5,000, but only a few. So as such, whatever they come up with will have questions on its authenticity. The well-known verse which is used to show that Jesus canceled the law of Moses, the law which required that adulterers and adulteresses be stoned to death. That when Jesus came across a woman who was to be stoned, he supposedly said, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Let him who is without sin amongst you be the first to throw a stone at her. So of course the people who were about to throw the stones, they all stopped. Because of course they were all sinners. And this became the logic behind not punishing in this fashion and later it became in any fashion people who commit adultery because who are you to judge them when you are yourself sinners and then the finger could be pointed at the Muslims who still uphold the principle of stoning to death the adulterer, adulteress that they are hateful individuals, spiteful, harsh individuals. They don't follow the religion of love and compassion. However, the fact of the matter is that this verse was among the verses deleted from the King James Version. Why? Because they said 
that it could not be found in any of the early manuscripts. It couldn't be found in any of the early manuscripts, meaning that it was interpolated, it was added by copyists later on to create this new religion which we now know as Christianity. Another verse which is pivotal in the Christian theology is the verse which supposedly addressed Trinity where Jesus was supposed to have said there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one this was the evidence in the scripture in the King James Version it's still there King James Version in 1st John 5 number 7 this verse is not contained in any Greek manuscript written earlier than the 15th century when the first translation was made it was added at that time it cannot be found it was in that same period that it was added into the Greek manuscripts of the Bible or Aramaic manuscripts it was added in that in the 15th century earlier than the 15th century that verse a pivotal verse for the Trinitarians could not be found in any of the early manuscripts not in some but in any so with that kind of background one has to question the reliability of the Bible as evidence to determine what the message of Jesus was and who he was. Who was he? Furthermore, to add more fuel to the fire, when we look at the authors of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, what we find according to Christian sources that believe that the five books of Moses, first five books, referred to as the Pentateuch, and this is what is referred to as the Torah, that these five books could not have been written by Moses. For Orthodox Jews, they believe that these five books were written 974 generations before the creation of the world. They believe that the five books, first five books of Moses, was created 974 generations before the creation of the world. And God dictated it to Moses during the 40 days that he was on Mount Sinai. That is their belief. Well, from a Muslim perspective, the true Torah was in the Lawh al Mahfuz, was already written in the heavens, like the Quran and all of the books of Revelation. And it was the Word of God, as was the Gospel, the Quran, and all of the books of Revelation. However, for Christian sources, they don't hold that belief. 
they believe that it was written by Moses. However, in the text itself, there are verses which indicate that this could not possibly have been written by Moses. In Deuteronomy 34 verses 5 to 8, it states there, So Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. And then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Did Moses write those words? Absolutely not. It is inconceivable that he would have written those words. Furthermore, biblical scholars of the 19th century in analyzing the text of the Old Testament, they came to conclude that actually there was more than one writing by a variety of different authors. Some of the documents they refer to as J and some they refer to as E because of the fact that Jehovah was used for God in one set of writings and when these same writings were repeated Elohim was used for God. So they could see there are two different authors here. And modern linguistic analysis by Professor Richard Friedman, he said that the five books of Moses are a mixture of Hebrew from the 9th, 8th, 7th, and 6th centuries before the time of Christ. Whereas according to their calculations, Moses was alive in the 13th century before Christ, 700 years previous. So big question marks. Furthermore, the other books of the Bible, like Judges, Ruth, 1st Samuel, 1st Kings, Esther, Job, Jonah, etc. All of these, the scholars say we don't know who the authors were. Furthermore, the Catholic Bible has an additional seven books which the Protestant Bible rejects, calls it the Apocrypha. So the Old Testament has great question marks regarding it. And the Gospels themselves, the same. As I mentioned earlier, issues about manuscripts is sufficient to raise major doubts. Of course, the language of Jesus was Aramaic according to the understanding of uh, scholars, historians, etc. because it was the popular language at that period of time. And it remained actually the most popular language all the way up until the 7th century. And it was only with the spread of Islam that Aramaic was overshadowed by Arabic. The Aramaic speaking peoples of the Middle East, whether in Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, these people shifted their major language over into Arabic. Even the Talmuds of the Jews, the ancient Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmuds are both written in Aramaic. So it's well known. This was the language of Jesus. However, the oldest of the gospel documents are, are written in what language? They're written in Greek. Greek which later became the dominant language of Greece and in knowledgeable people of Rome and parts of Turkey, etc. Those who are converting to Christianity as promoted by Paul were from Greek-speaking backgrounds. So Greek became the dominant language 
of Christians from the first century onwards. So who then wrote the Gospels? With regards to Mark, he is not mentioned among the disciples of Jesus in the first place. Nobody really knows who he is. Some said he was a Christian author. Some said he was a scribe and companion of Paul. Some said a variety of other things. Anyway, point is, who Mark was, God alone knows. And when you go to the other Gospels, which are named after disciples, Matthew, Luke, and John, these three other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, though named after disciples, Christian scholars admit openly that these were written not by the disciples, but by others who use these names in order to promote to promote these books in the early centuries. It's not surprising that when one goes into the texts, after seeing this level of inauthenticity, that the texts of both the Old Testament and the New Testament are filled with errors, among the Gospels in particular, filled with contradictions, where in one uh, chapter of the Bible it says one thing, another chapter says another thing. One Gospel says one thing, another Gospel says another thing. That is common. If we swing over to the Quran, the other scripture, what we find is that we have a text which is unique in religious texts. One which does not have other versions. Research done on manuscripts gathered, over 42,000 manuscripts were gathered in the University of Munich in Germany. The Germans were the leading orientalists studying uh, Islamic or Muslim manuscripts and writings back in the 1800s and early 1900s. So they gathered over 42,000 manuscripts, collated them, analyzed them, and came to the conclusion that they are from one single text. They did find a few copying mistakes, but they were few and far between. And they didn't imply or indicate a different text. This is the Quran. One which has been preserved so much so that Orientalists like Richard A. Nicholson, Professor Richard A. Nicholson said, we have in the Quran materials of unique and incontestable authority for tracing the origin and early development of Islam. Such materials as do not exist in the case of Buddhism or Christianity or any other ancient religion. And many such statements, similar statements from Western authorities. So, on to the person of Jesus. Who was he? According to the Quran, he was a messenger of Allah. As Allah said, And remember when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah sent to you, confirming the Torah which came before me. That's what is stated in the Quran. We can find support for it in Matthew 21 verse 11. And the crowd said, this is a prophet. This is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth, of Galilee. And in Mark 6, 4 we find, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. And in John 17, verse 3, Jesus is quoted as saying, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 
Why would I quote from the Gospels after pointing out its inauthenticity? Because of the fact that the general inauthenticity of the text doesn't mean that it doesn't contain anything authentic. Muslims do believe in the truth of the Gospels and the Torah and the, all of the earlier books, only that they have been changed. But how do we know what is truth amongst them? When we compare it to the Qur'an, we find that there is support for it in the Qur'an, then we can be certain this much is true from the Gospels or the Torah. With regards to Jesus being a man, of course the Qur'an refers to him as Jesus, son of Mary. And he's the only one who is referred to in the Qur'an in this way. The only prophet mentioned in this way is Jesus, Jesus the son of Mary. To affirm his humanity, that he was a human being. And even in the Gospels, in spite of their distortions, we still find statements there. In John 14 verse 28, the Father is greater than I. In John 20 verse 17, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, unto my God and your God. And we also find in Timothy, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. The man Jesus Christ. So that is who Jesus was. He was a man and a messenger of God. As regards his immaculate conception that he was born without a father, that is affirmed in the Quran in far more detailed evidences than in the Bible itself. However, Jesus performed miracles which led those who look back at his miracles and consider him to be God, it led them to conclude that these were evidences of him being God. However, virtually every one of the miracles attributed to Jesus can be found done by prophets of the Old Testament. And the various statements attributed to Jesus like that found in the book of Revelations verse 8 I am Alpha and, the, and Omega the beginning and ending saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty such statements Christian scholars have correct, corrected themselves confirming that this was not the statement of Jesus but of God and other statements attributed to Jesus where it, they indicate that he existed before being in this world like Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you before Abraham was I am we can find similar statements found in the Old Testament as in Proverbs where Prophet Solomon says ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. So these type of metaphorical statements cannot be used as evidence that Jesus was God. Even the phrase Son of God, which Jesus never uses to describe himself, and others use it, we find this term uh, used to describe many of the prophets of the Old Testament, and even Adam is mentioned in the Gospels as the Son of God. Other statements like Jesus being one with the Father, being in the Father, he said the same thing to his followers, that as I am in the Father, you are in me. So if being in the Father meant he and the Father were one, then it meant that his disciples were also one with him and with God. The argument that he accepted worship, as found in John 9, 37, 38, 
Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This is the one verse which may be used to argue that people around Jesus worshipped him, or at least that individual did, and Jesus accepted it. However, in the American Bible, scholars who put it together put in a footnote for verse 38, which said that the man worshipped Jesus. They said, this verse omitted in important early manuscripts may be an addition for baptismal liturgy. Its origin is not from the early manuscripts. And other statements like in the beginning it was the word found in John. These are not actually statements of Jesus, which scholars themselves admit. So, if we move on to the message of Jesus, what was Jesus' message? We have to say that fundamentally his message was one of submission. As is recorded in Matthew 7, 22, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Also you can find in John 5, verse 30, I can do nothing of my own authority. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the essence of what Jesus claimed as his message, what he was conveying to people was submission to the will of God, which indicates that that message was none other than Islam, because Islam means submission to the will of God. And Jesus affirmed the law, the law of Moses. He didn't change it. He didn't break it. And he said, as recorded in Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17, But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And in Matthew 5, 19, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Think not that I come to abolish the law and the way of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in Romans 7, 6, we find the opposite stated by Paul. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. This was Paul's claim. He abolished the law. He claimed a new dispensation, the New Testament. Jesus affirmed the Old Testament, meaning the message which was brought by all of the prophets of God. And Jesus, in his various statements and his practices, reaffirmed the oneness of God. He worshipped. He prayed. This demonstrated to his companions that there was God and there was one God. And when he was asked about the kingdoms of this world and tempted by the devil, he said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's in Luke 3, verse 8. And he prophesied the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The counselor, Christians, commonly take to mean the Holy Spirit. But obviously, this couldn't be that here. Because they believe that the Holy Spirit was present in the world in the time of Jesus. Whereas Jesus is saying that the counselor won't come unless I leave. So obviously he was talking about one to come after him. And in the end, to conclude, 
When we look at the way of Jesus, we find that his way is the same as that taught in the Quran. The way of all of the prophets. That way begins on a physical level with circumcision. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, Luke 2:21. The idea that God was circumcised on the eighth day is ludicrous. But circumcision is a part of the covenant with God. And Jesus didn't eat pork, nor blood, nor did he drink alcohol. Even the verse where he was supposed to have turned alcohol into wine, scholars doubt its authenticity as it's found only in the Gospel of John. The other three Gospels don't contain it. And he made ablution before prayers. And he prostrated in prayers. He fell down on his face in prayer. As did the prophets before him, mentioned in the Old Testament. And the women of his time wore veils, hijab. They covered themselves. And he greeted his companions and those around him, saying, Shalom Aleichem, Salam Aleikum. That's how he greeted them. And that's how the earlier prophets greeted. And he fasted 40 days and nights, not one day or two, giving up chocolates. No, he fasted, a real fast. And he was against interest, as it was forbidden in the text of Moses, in the Torah, in Deuteronomy. And he did not prohibit polygamy, though people have concluded that in Jesus' practice, what we find is that Christians practiced polygamy all the way up until the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. They understood it to be permissible. And the earlier prophets, whether it's Solomon, Moses, uh, Abraham and the others, were all known to be polygamous. So in conclusion, we have to say, without a doubt, that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was a man sent by God as a prophet and a messenger to humankind. He brought a message which was submission to the will of God. It was the same message brought by all of the prophets of God, all the way back to Adam. The religion of Adam was Islam. Some may question, how can you claim that? Well, we know definitely it was not Judaism because that came into existence after the time of Moses. We know it was not Christianity because Jesus himself never even used that term. What we know is that Adam was commanded not to eat from the tree. What was required of him was submission to God, to obey God. Don't eat from the tree. And that is Islam, submission to God. But whatever tree God has forbidden us is forbidden to us and we should submit and not eat from it. That is the religion of God. And Jesus, a man, son of Mary, carried that same message and that message is preserved in Islam today. So for those Christians who would like to follow Jesus as he taught, as he received from God, then I invite you to come to Islam and follow the truth from God Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shazakallahu khaira, Dr. Abu